Well, we're going to look at a passage in a moment in Daniel. Uh, the word that I continued to hear from the Lord was the word ancient. And uh, Holy Spirit wanted to really have a time of delving into that. So we'll do that this morning. We see in Proverbs 8, 23 from the complete Jewish Bible, Adonai made, Tana created, Adonai made me, and this is the spirit of wisdom speaking. Adam, Adonai made me as the beginning of his way, the first of his ancient Kedem works. I was appointed before the world, before the start, before the earth's beginnings. Wisdom is chokmah. In Hebrew, it's a feminine noun, and it means shrewdness, skill in administration, war, spiritual and ethical affairs, science, and academics. So the feminine spirit of chokmah is not Holy Spirit, because we know this, number one, it's in the feminine, and also it's a created spirit. The Holy Spirit is not created. But the feminine spirit of chokmah was created before God began forming the natural universe. It is an ancient spirit. So we see this, that the spirit of wisdom is talking about the ancient, the Kedem works of God. We see guarding ancient entry. He drove out the man, which is actually in the plural, it's, it's Adam, it's for the humanity, uh, the human race. He drove out humanity, and at the east, Kedem, of the garden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So because of their sin of disloyalty to him, Jehovah drove Adam and Eve, thus humanity as a whole, all of us, out of the garden, and he prohibited access to the ancient, the Kedem truths and reality that they had known in it. So the eyes of their minds would now be blind to this existence, and they would never be able to reacquire it on their own. And that's key. So there was an angel to guard the ancient entry to the garden. We see ancient mysteries. Pharaoh gave Joseph the name Zaphonath Panea and gave him a wife, Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest at On. And Joseph went throughout the land of Egypt, Genesis 41, 45. So Joseph's Egyptian name means revealer of mysteries. So Joseph served as a type for those who choose to allow their hearts and minds and personal character to be reshaped by the heart, mind, and character of God himself. And we see that in Joseph's life. And these are the ones who have access to divine truths and mysteries by his spirit, which is a shadow of the beginning of the restoration of Eden in the earth. So as Adam and Eve chose to sin, they chose to rebel. And the cost of that is that they were driven out of the garden. And there was an angel there to protect that. They could not re-enter. They could not enter into the, the ancient reality of the garden. But God is redemptive. And his plan was to bring us back to that place in time. And so we see types and shadows of his beginnings of his redemptive work. And Joseph is one of these uh, in a big way in the Old Testament, uh, because he did have a heart that was shaped in home. And he was not a perfect man, but he desired the character of God. He desired the mind of God. And so the Lord anointed him and blessed him to understand divine truths, to reveal mysteries that would be glorifying to God, and it would bless the people of the earth. And we see ancient blessing. Blessed the Lord be Joseph, with the best things of the ancient Kedem mountains, and with the choice things of the everlasting hills. And this is Deuteronomy 33, 13, and 15. So this is Moses, and he's blessing the tribes. So when he spoke over Joseph, Joseph's tribe, his descendants, and Joseph, remember, had been a high-ranking prince, he prayed that his descendants would be granted depth of insight into the ancient truths and reality of God. And we see in Jeremiah 33, 11, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. So this ancient blessing is transferred spiritually to all who are called to Yeshua's ecclesia and who desire to lead God's people well. So remember, the, the cost of sin was intimacy with God. It was to be driven out of the garden. It was to be blinded to these ancient truths and mysteries. 
but God wanted to restore that. And we see these types and shadows, and we see through Joseph's line in particular that those who have a heart after God, they want to lead well in seeking him and him alone and asking that he will in his way, in his time, by his spirit, reveal these divine things. And you, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because the enemy said of you, aha, and the ancient heights have become our possession. Now, ancient, here's a little different word in Hebrew. It's olam. It literally means concealed, a time out of mind, whether past or future, ancient time, continual time, or perpetuity. And heights is bama, and it's a feminine noun. It means a high place, an elevation, a mountain, a battlefield, or a worship platform. So God's enemies reveled in the fact that humans had lost their intimacy and complete interaction with the ancient realities of God, and that they now had control over these things in the earth. So we forfeited our authority, and God's enemies took that authority and began to dominate in the earth. And they were reveling over this. This is Ezekiel, and in the same prophecy, therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealous wrath because you have suffered the reproach of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I swear that the nations that are all around you shall themselves suffer reproach. But you, O mountains of Israel, shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they will soon come home. For behold, I am with you and I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply people on you the whole house of Israel, all of it, the city shall be inhabited and the waste places rebuilt. So in responding to the taunts of his enemies against his children, God spoke of a divine reversal and a coming restoration. And this would come by ancient power. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God, sing praises to the Lord, to him who rides in the heavens, the ancient, the Kedem heavens, Behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice, ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel and whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. We see Psalm 74, 12. God, my king, is from ancient times performing saving acts on the earth. And so it's a call for the ancient. Awake, awake, arm of Adonai, clothe yourself with strength. Awake as in the days of old, as in ancient Kedem generations. Wasn't it you who hacked Rehob to pieces? You who pierced the sea monster. So the cry to God for strength, protection, and restoration is the call for him to awaken his ancient strength to manifest among us in the present. And he would do this through an ancient infant. And those are categorically uh, oppositional words, to be ancient and be an infant, but that's exactly who Yeshua is. But you, Bethlehem, house of bread, Ephrathah, place of fruitfulness, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient Kedem days. So the greatest power move against the enemies of God would be launched on earth through the physical birth of the ancient Son of God. Remember, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Son of God. He is God. He is uncreated. He has always existed. He has no beginning and he has no ending. But as a human being, he was created. He took on a created body. So he's the ancient infant. He did take on humanity. So the uncreated one was dwelling in a created body. So this great power move of God against these forces would be launched through the physical birth of his ancient son. Thus, the one who has always existed was born into that which was created in order to take back humanity's lost dominion, to set captives free, and to restore that which was ruined by the darkness. And we see his mantle in Isaiah 61, 1 through 4, which he himself said this prophecy is fulfilled when he was in his hometown of Nazareth in the synagogue. And he is the ancient God of is. 
As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. I ancient hears the word atik, and it's an Aramaic word, advanced, ancient, aged, venerable, accorded respect due to age, wisdom, or character. Now, what we can see in this is the one true God has various seats. In this moment in time, the one who had been living forever, the ancient God of is, took his seat in the ultimate high court, preparing to render his case decisions. So we see God, of course, is God of all things, king of all things. He has a throne, but he's also judge of all things. So he has a seat in his court as well. And so Daniel is now seeing a scene where the most high God is taking his seat in his high court. Now, remember the name Jehovah, one of God's names means self-existent one or existence itself. God is. So he's the God of is, and we need to remember that. So he's, Daniel is seeing something that's profound here, to say the least, and he's using apocalyptic language to uh, express it. There's really no way to express this in human terms, but he's doing the best he can. In verses 13 to 14 of Daniel 7, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Now, what's so profound about this is that Psalm 2, 7 through 9, Daniel 7, 13, which is this passage, and Luke 19, 12 are all interrelated and are all one in the same truth. Psalm 2, 7 through 9, we see God speaking, God the Father speaking, we see Yeshua answering him, and then we see Holy Spirit speaking. Now, what was happening there? Well, when God speaks, he is offering his kingdom to his son as inheritance, the earthly kingdom. And we see in verses 7 through 9 of Psalm 2, where his son responds, he says, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. All right, Daniel 7, 13 Daniel is seeing a vision of this. He's seeing the son coming before the father. He's asking for his kingdom. And Abba, Jehovah, is granting this kingdom to his son. All right, what is Luke 19, 12? That's the parable of the minas. Yeshua was teaching, and he, he's referring to himself, but he's telling it in parabolic story. And he was saying there was one who uh, left. He granted gifts. He granted minas, responsibility to servants, and he said he went away to receive a kingdom, and then he would return. Well, he's talking about himself. So all three of these different passages in Scripture are talking about the same moment in time, the same event. This is when Yeshua is coming before his Father to receive his promised inheritance of all the kingdoms of the earth and the, the entire earth. So again, the Most High God installed his Son as his chosen king. But meanwhile, back on earth, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them, verse 21 of Daniel 7. So the formal eternal installation of Yeshua as king of kings in the heavens did not automatically and immediately change circumstances on earth. Now we can know this, number one, Christ is already king of kings and lord of lords. He's already been installed. But we can also look around the earth and go, huh, this doesn't look exactly like everything is hunky-dory yet. So while the census of the kingdom of God has been increasing since Yeshua was here the first time, the territorial mountains of earthly government have yet to be taken. Darkness has continued to war powerfully against God's holy ones. The domain of darkness has been to this point prevailing in their resistance against being overthrown and defeated. Daniel saw, I looked, and the horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. And so we see there's still this period of prevailing when uh, dark forces and evil schemes do have impact. Uh, they do have more than influence. They have control over things in many ways. Until 
God's gavel sounded. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. Now, possessed here is chasan, and it's an Aramaic word. It means to take possession of, to be treasured up, be hoarded, to hold in occupancy. So Daniel saw the future when God's decision was rendered that it was time for the dark rulers, supernatural and natural, to be brought down. And this would be the time for his people to occupy and rule those territories and positions of authority and to steward the earth's wealth and resources for God's glory and the blessing of his people. And we saw last week that Abba is saying, my gavel has sounded. And we are living in this time. Now, exposing the fourth beast... In verse 23 of Daniel 7, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces. So as God's spirit is speaking to Daniel and giving him revelation through vision and makes these statements to him, then he comes behind that and he starts explaining to Daniel uh, the, the depth and the meaning of these visions, of this vision. And so we can understand this. The three previous dominant beasts, which are dark empires that Daniel saw, were Egypt, Babylon, and Greece. Now, Daniel is living in the time of the second beast. He's living in the time of the empire of Babylon. Greece had not yet even emerged. So the third beast hadn't emerged yet at the time Daniel was living. But the fourth kingdom is the spiritual Roman empire, which has been dominating and devouring the whole earth since the time of Christ. First John 5, 19, John said, we know we are from God, but the whole world lies under the power of evil. Now, John said this after Christ had already come. He'd already been here. He'd already taught them. He'd already died. He'd already been resurrected. He'd already been translated back into the heavenly realm. And John says, still, the whole world lies under the power of evil. So this is the, they were under the Roman government, the civil Roman government at that time but the spiritual Roman government still exists. So the civil Rome that we knew 2,000 years ago has faded away, but not the spirit behind it. The spiritual Roman empire has been dominating the world ever since. And there's a period of prevailing darkness. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change the times and the season, the law, <clears throat> excuse me, and then... It shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So God showed Daniel that the fourth beast would be the most dominant of all, and that it would experience a measure of prevailing in carrying out its plans, but this would be allowed by God only for a specific time period. Now, the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, the spiritual Roman Empire, has been the most dominant of all because it would have total control in the earth. It would reach over all the nations something that the Egyptians, the Babylonians, and the Greeks did not have. They had a lot of domination, but the spiritual Roman Empire basically covers the earth, and that's what God was speaking. And he was prophesying that to Daniel and saying that. And we can see that among us, really think about that in our own uh, lives. We operate under a Roman calendar. We don't operate under the Hebrew calendar. Uh, watch the Super Bowl, Roman numerals. <laughs> The Big 12, Roman numerals, uh, the, the NFL run by Freemasons. I mean, all of that, it, we're under it. We talked last week about the 666, the mark of the beast. That's on every UPC code that you use. Every time you scan a code, 666, six, company name, six, product name, six. Google Chrome, 666, stylized in a circle. We've been under the Roman government since Jesus was here. That hasn't changed. Until now, until now, God said that he would allow the fourth beast, the spiritual Roman Empire, to rule for a time, but that time is up. There's a new sheriff in town. But the court shall sit in judgment, and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven 
shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them in him. Daniel 7, 26 through 27. So again, if you're still wondering if all the dystopic stuff and the future of the world is horrible, you need to read the scriptures because that's not the case. Christ is one. He has dominion. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes, the Lord has allowed the fourth beast to operate for a time because people have chosen that, but this time is up. And where's the dominion coming? Well, it's going to come to God's people. Yeshua rules through his people. And dominion is shotan, and it's an Aramaic word. It means sovereignty, realm of rule. So the most high absolute ruler will flip the script on the darkness at his command and establish his eternal loving dominion on earth through the rule he grants to his people in Christ. So we're going back to the ancient future. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient Kedem times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. So God's plan is not up for a boat. It's not in the balance in any way. He is accomplishing his purpose himself through his son by the power of Holy Spirit. The why factor in the equation has to do with the choice of each person to join him or to remain in the judged rebellion. See, that's, that's what's in the balance. That God is God, that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's not up for a vote. <laughs> and again, Dominion software not going to put a false king on the throne of God. God has already chosen his son, Yeshua has already chosen his inheritance, and that's established. And Christ is taking his whole earth back. He created it. He paid for it by his blood and death, though we sinned, and all of it's been granted back to him. So those things are not at all in the equation of any kind of wondering or doubting. The only why factor in this equation is whether or not we want to be involved. We're either going to remain in rebellion, or we're going to remain, or we're going to come into allegiance, but it's one of the two. So he declared this truth of the future from ancient times, and he is restoring the ancient future. You know, this goes into so much more depth than I really know. I know what I'm saying is true. I just don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but when you go back to Eden, and it's been Best we can, in our finite minds and the limited understanding that we have, we realize before Adam and Eve chose to rebel, Adam and Eve lived in, on a mountain. That's uh, the Hebrew teachings tell us that, that Eden was on a mountain. And so you have this divine confluence of God's heavenly spiritual supernatural kingdom and his natural kingdom all together. And so you have this uh, seamless connection between the angelic beings and supernatural beings and natural beings of God in Adam and Eve, and all dwelling together in harmony and peace and beauty, and all of that was robbed and destroyed uh, through our sin. But Christ take, took care of that on the cross. All that dominion has now been restored in him, so it comes through him. And so what God is doing is our future is our past, our ancient past, and he's going to be restoring all that. We're going to have a time throughout all eternity when there's a divine confluence between the natural and the supernatural, God's supernatural beings and his natural sons and daughters, all coexisting beautifully and well for God's glory and the blessing of those who worship him. So we're going to go back to the ancient future. And the ancient truths, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old, from Kedem. Psalm 78, 1 through 2. Dark sayings here doesn't mean evil. It's kidah. It means a puzzle, a conundrum, an enigmatic saying, a riddle, a perplexing question. So this will usher in a time of eternal restoration of ancient truths and wisdom being released, understood, and utilized to glorify God and bless his people. See, Adam and Eve lost all of that. We lost all of that, that to have that visual sight, that spiritual sight, that 
those uh, clean and clear minds and hearing God's truths and him revealing mysteries to us and releasing technologies to us and understanding and healing and all of these things, that is going to be restored. God's going to be glorified through that. We're going to be blessed. And the ancient future is arriving and really is already here. You know, Yeshua said that uh, when he was on earth, he said a time is coming and has already come. He said that many times in his teaching. And that's effectively where we are now. The ancient future is arriving and really has already arrived. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he, being Yeshua, Jesus, said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. But to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Mark 4, 23 through 25. So what we see is Yeshua is teaching here. He's saying, pay attention to what you're hearing. With the measure you use, it will be used to you. I mean, measured to you. What he's saying in that is when he speaks truth to you, if you put limits on it, then that's all you're going to get. Or if you close the door to it and say, no, I, I'm, I don't receive that. Or, I, you know, and then he's saying then basically what you've been given, if that's your stance in the spirit, then that what was given is going to be taken away. But for those who are paying attention to what Holy Spirit is saying and you're receiving what he's saying, then he's just going to continue to add more and more and more. He'll give more revelation. He'll give more understanding. Now, this is for his glory, God's glory, and for the blessing of his people. It's not for our own glory. It's not for our own use or purposes. We're to steward what he's given us to bring glory to his name, to expand his kingdom, and to bless his people. We see in 2 Peter 1, 19 through 20, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that first of all, no prophecy of scripture come from someone's own interpretation. So Peter's saying effectively the same thing Yeshua was saying. Pay attention to what God is saying. He speaks by his spirit. He speaks by his word. And, and don't put limits on God. Uh, don't filter what he's saying through your own understanding. Ask Holy Spirit to give you that understanding. Test that. Ask for that confirmation. He'll give that to you. But continue to remain open to him. And fix your eyes on Christ, as the writer of the Hebrews said. Listen to Holy Spirit, because he's speaking now. Yeshua is on his white horse. We saw that in last week in Revelation 19. Christ is not physically present on the earth in Revelation 19. He's physically present in Revelation 20. Psalm 110, Abba said, my Lord, sit to, the Lord said to my Lord, and David's writing this, sit at my right hand until I make the, your enemies a footstool for your feet. So we understand that Yeshua is coming back, no question about it. But when is he coming back? Well, we don't know when, but we know when he's not coming back. He's not coming back until his enemies have been made a footstool for his feet. So how's that going to happen? Well, that's going to happen through us, through his ecclesia rising, through us listening to Holy Spirit, through us following his instruction, through us taking dominion in the earth, not fighting with the weapons of the world, but the word of God, love, truth truth, grace, peace, wisdom. That's God's heart. That's his character. And that's how he rules step by step. Like this ministry, marketplace ministry, when businesses start giving their hearts over to God and Yeshua begins to reign in the business places, when he starts reigning in the schools, when he starts reigning in government, when he starts reigning in uh, entertainment and arts, that's how he's taking dominion in the earth. And so we are right now, the gavel has sounded. Abba has said, enough is enough. I've rendered my judgment. The fourth beast is coming down. Its time is up. So if the time is up for the fourth beast, whose time is it? It's time for the ecclesia to rise and take the seat that God intends. The ancient future is arriving. It's already here. It's about Yeshua's ancient return. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, Kedem, and the Mountain of Olives shall be split in two from east. Now, here's a word play here because we have two different words in Hebrew for east. Kedem means ancient and also eastward, but we also see 
uh, Mizraf, which means east as well. So we see something different happening here, but it's split from the east to the west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half shall move southward. Now, Zechariah's metaphorical prophecy of Christ's literal return. So Christ is literally returning, but he's using metaphorical prophecy to explain what's going to happen. In his literal return, it speaks of his presence on earth being the deciding split between those who have chosen evil, which is the northward direction. Remember, the enemy said, I will ascend to the sides of the north. Now, God is of, of the greater north, of the ultimate north. But all evil comes from a northward direction because that's where the evil ascends to or desires to ascend to. All the ancient enemies of Israel attacked from the north. In Bashan, that evil place was in the north of Israel. When Christ took his disciples to uh, the gates of hell, that was north of Israel. So the northward direction is representative of those who choose evil. And the southward direction is for those who choose righteousness. The separation, Zechariah was saying, will be wide and distinct, and there won't be anything in the middle. So there's that split that he's talking about uh, when Yeshua comes. Uh, when he touches down, when he's back, when he's revealed, then hearts are going to be revealed. And those who still pursue evil will go in that northward, metaphorically, direction. And those who desire righteousness will go southward, metaphorically. And that's what we're being prepared for. Abba, Father, in Yeshua's name and your Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for your living word to us. Lord, in our finite minds, there's no way that we can grasp the height, the depth, or the breadth of this word. But by your grace, Lord, we can understand what's necessary for today and now. And Lord, you said to us, Yeshua, you said, by the measure we use, it will be measured to us. So, Lord, we don't want to use our own measure. We don't want to put limits on what you want to say to us, explain to us, or do through us. Lord, we open our hearts, minds, spirit, soul, and body wide open to you and simply ask that you would be pleased to use us as your vessels. Lord, we're just simply stewarding what you've given, who you are, your abilities, your purpose, your word. It's not about us, but you involve us if we're willing, and that is our desire. Father, we thank you so much for your word of encouragement today. You know, we know that your word is truth, and we know the fourth beast will fall. And Lord, we are believing that your gavel has fallen indeed, that it is time. It's time for your ecclesia to rise in Holy Spirit and the authority of Yeshua, fixing our eyes on you, Lord Jesus, never taking them off, and allowing you to govern and reign through us. You do, through, do so through love, through wisdom, through grace, through the power of your word. Lord, install your rulers, your kings, your queens in the mountains of government in the earth. Step by step, day by day, your kingdom is now advancing, and you're advancing through your people. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being allowed to be a part of this advance. Lord, we want this earth to be restored to your glory, to your rule, to your authority. We want to be a part of that. It shall be and is forever and ever. Amen and amen. Grace and peace to you.